Hi, everybody. Hi, good day. Yay, we're so excited to be with you today. As you jump on, please say hi so we know that uh, you are you're actually here and please give us a thumbs up or a like hey we can see you and hear you okay uh, in the chat box i apologize we're a few minutes late uh, but thank you jesus for um husbands that uh that know what they're doing with technology <laughs> well, well know enough to get through yeah <laughs> but we've made it so good to be with you all hi everyone hi. Oh, i can see people joining yeah. it's just wonderful to have you here today i am really excited about what the lord is going to do uh this morning well i guess this morning and this evening, evening wherever yes. you are in the world um I just want to give you a quick rundown uh, just for a minute or so. Why in the world um, are we doing this Facebook Live webinar um, thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you call mini, mini it? Webinar, mini, mini, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so a couple of weeks ago, the Lord really highlighted the scriptures to me um, out of Matthew 7, uh, verses 13 and 14, and talking about the narrow gate and the wide gate. And every time I would sit with the Lord, he kept speaking to me out of these scriptures and then led me into uh, Matthew 16, 25, uh, all about you know losing your life to find it. And the more I sat with the Lord, the more I felt his heart of just, He wanting he's wanting to encourage us as the body of Christ right now and, uh, and what it looks like to walk in, in surrender and walk in life in Christ. And so I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do today. I am so, so like thankful to God um, for these amazing guests that we're going to have this morning. We have uh, Paul Keith and Amy Davies. We have Gary Beaton, uh, Natalie Fuller, Tom Ledbetter. Uh, Matt Beckenham and Jody Hughes. Jody Hughes and us. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have joined uh, any of these, um, I want to call it like a, a kind of a round table or a mini conference yeah. in the last couple of weeks, um, you will know that these spaces have been a place of rich uh, revelation. We've received lots of testimonies from you guys of what the Lord has been doing. So we're just excited to create this space. And our heart is that you will be deeply ministered to today and uh, and that you would encounter the Lord. So mm. is there anything Amen. that you want to say before um, yeah, we introduce sure. our us um, two amazing what one, one thing that people will often ask after these events is how do i sew into the speakers how do we sew into this and we purposefully haven't made this you know we haven't we purposely made these things free because we, we don't want these things to cost you anything um however this time just to make things simple what i have done i've set up a donor box campaign um and i'll put the link at the bottom of the box if you feel led and you want to sew into it, what we'll do is we'll take all of the donations across the day and uh, we'll wait, I think we'll probably wait a week or two as well, just because people do watch these things in the weeks to come. Um, and so we'll just take all of those donations and we'll divide them across all the speakers. We haven't told any of the speakers this. They've they've offered no. their time um, free of Amazing. charge. They've, they've just been very generous for their time and, and we want to be generous with them. So this is a bit of a surprise for them. Mm -hmm. um, if you yeah if you feel led do not feel any obligation um the links at the bottom of the screen and uh we'll we'll repeat this a few times over because people do come in and out so if you do hear this message a few times in please we're not we're not spoken for money um but if you do want to sew then please we, we want to welcome you to partner with that um the speakers will probably go for about half an hour each you'll see the uh, you've seen the list um i've tried to keep that as true to the uh the run sheet as possible um so if you if you do want to um yeah so if, if you are wanting to know when someone's coming on um look i'm, I'm not going to make any guarantees uh we we, we don't we don't stick to a tight schedule and the shorter i speak the uh the, the closer <laughs> yeah, the schedule will be so <laughs> i'm, I'm going to go back to lana and okay to start. well can you bring up our first two amazing there, yes, they, are. there they are hi paul keith and amy yeah. so good to have you guys thank you for being with us today yeah, 
Oh, we're so honored. Um, guys, I know that you, all of you are probably looking at this screen going, we are so familiar with Paul, Keith and Amy. Um, they are just not only just so dear to our hearts, um, mm -hmm. what they carry, what they're releasing, their purity, their integrity, their wisdom. Amen. Oh my goodness. I personally have just been so impacted by uh, what the Lord is releasing through them. And, you know, for many years I've been following White Dove Ministries and I've just been so, like my testimony, like is part of my journey was just so impacted uh, by Paul Keith and, and now with Amy. And so I know that you guys are going to be so, so blessed by what they are going to release. So again, guys, thank you so much. And uh, we love you and go with the flow of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. great. Well, awesome, guys. Um, thank you for having us. Um, Amy and I are very happy to be here with you. And kind of amazing, you know, that we're sitting here in our kitchen in Oregon and talking to people all over the world. It's still a pretty amazing miracle. And, and um, you know, we've got a few minutes here, so I'm just gonna kind of jump right into what we're gonna share. Um, because I think the scriptures that have been highlighted are very important. In fact, um, I think it might be one of the most important messages of the hour for the church. I'll just say at the outset, you know, we all are believing for the harvest, you know. That's got to be on the heart of every person. We want to see the harvest. But we also know that harvest is more than evangelism. Harvest is everything coming to maturity simultaneously. And we're seeing the tares coming to maturity right now. So that means the wheat, the sons of the kingdom, must come to maturity at the same time. So what does that mean? That means there's a real spiritual conflict. But I believe that the first wave of, if I can use this word, revival, the first wave of awakening will happen in the church. There must be, before we can bring the lost in, there must be a true, genuine, apostolic structure that has plumb line revelation into which we bring the harvest. So therefore, I feel like in this passage in Matthew chapter 7 especially, you know, a lot of people may look at it that, you know, it's the distinction between people that are lost and people that are saved, and it can't have that application. But you have to remember, Matthew 7 is part of the... Um, the Beatitudes and, and the discourse that he gave to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And when you get to, to Matthew chapter 7, he says, The gate is small, the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are they that enter. He's actually speaking to Jewish people. He's speaking to the seed of Abraham. And they had this mentality that by virtue of their birth, they were entering the kingdom of heaven. But now he's coming to tell us there's a, a better way. There's a better covenant. And that if anyone enters into the presence of the Father, they must do, do so through him. He is the gate. He is the way. We all know that. And so I do believe that you can have the, the paradigm of, you know, there is one way to the Father. That's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Islam won't get you there. Buddha won't get you there. Any of the other religions will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. So to that extent, that's a narrow gate. But I also believe that he is speaking to the church. And I believe right now, uh, I did a message, in fact, called Another Exodus. And uh, we, we learned from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he said, you know, I betrothed you to Christ as a pure virgin, but I'm afraid as he was deceived by the serpent, so you've been deceived. And he goes on to make a phenomenal, profound statement. He says, for there is another gospel, another Jesus, and another spirit. And in my view, prophetically, that's what the Lord is addressing right now, corporately, globally, with the church. We all probably have had some measure of influence on our lives by that other spirit, whether we came out of quote, unquote, uh, structured denominational systems or, or whether it was teaching, traditional teaching. We all have had some measure of influence by that. But right now we're having our robes washed white by the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's important to note in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, the very next verse, he says, there are many false prophets coming to you as 
in sheep clothing, but inwardly they're actually ravenous wolves. So here's the point I want to make before I turn it over to Amy. I believe right now there is an, a major emphasis on the church for people to come out from under the influence of the other gospel, the other Jesus, and the other spirit. I'll tell a very quick story. I had a, I have a friend uh, many years ago, back in the 90s, uh, this, this friend was a high-level instructor in one of the most well-known theological seminaries in America. And uh, we were sitting around the table at a conference one time because he had had a revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and basically had to lay down, lay down everything he had taught and believed in seminary to embrace the truth. But here's what he said to me that I thought was fascinating. He said he remembered when he would begin to address the seminary students, and he would begin to tell them that the Lord does not feel anymore. And the Lord does not fill people with the Holy Spirit and prophesy anymore. All the things that he was going to teach that the Lord didn't do anymore, which, of course, is contrary to Scripture. But this is what he said. He said, I could literally stand there and I could feel a spirit come over me. He said, literally, the hairs on the back of my neck would stand up and I would feel this inspiration. I would feel this energy and I would begin to refute the very things that we all believe for now. And he realized later, he said, I was anointed with another spirit. I was anointed with another gospel. And he realized he was teaching to seminary another Jesus. And I believe right now, Donna and Kevin and all the people that are watching, that we are being given a grace to come out from under the influence of that other gospel, whatever it may be. I remember over in you know, an amazing passage the Lord has highlighted to me over the last few months, Hebrews chapter 3, where it talks about the Lord bringing out of Egypt millions of, of the Jewish people out after captivity, but they uh, had a spirit of unbelief, and because of the unbelief, they all perished in the wilderness. Revelation chapter 3, you know, I believe what Paul identified in Second Corinthians 11, this other gospel, this other Jesus, this other spirit, has come to maturity today. It was only in seed form in the early church. Now it is full blown. And I believe you see it manifested in the Laodicean church, where the, the major spirit, which I think is fair to say, the major spirit many face today is lukewarm Laodicean Christianity. And the Lord said, I'll spew that out of my mouth. You know, we can't mince words about it. Jesus said, I will vomit that right out of my mouth. And I, I know, you know, here's the good news. Here's the good news. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 3 that we have the seed of God abiding in us. It says in Matthew chapter 24, there's basically, he's paraphrasing, he said, there's another gospel out there so close to the real, it would deceive the very elected if it were possible. What makes that impossible for the elect? The seed of God. Peter says that we are that we are to fervently love one another, for we have been born again not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. We have the seed of our Father abiding in us. And I believe water, if you will, the Holy Spirit is being poured upon that seed. And when that's the life of that seed is coming out, and we're beginning to recognize this other gospel, this other spirit and this other Jesus that, that is the broad way. And we're beginning to embrace the narrow way. <laughs> I was talking with someone last week before I turned this over here to Amy. But I was just speaking with someone uh, just not even last week, just maybe three days ago. And um, they were in a, a Methodist church and um, the pastor got filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, had a thousand members Free infilling. <laughs> he had a thousand members. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. Came to church on that Sunday. I probably shouldn't have named the denomination. It's too late now. <laughs> anyway, came to service that Sunday. Preached Acts chapter two, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and lost four hundred members overnight. Well, that's a clear. That was just in the last few days. This past weekend. So I believe. Here's my ultimate point. 
I believe there's about to be another exodus from that system. There is about to be a great awakening among believers that have been captured, if you will, by the Laodicean lukewarm spirit. You know, people want to get out of this thing without having a cost, but I want you to know something. To serve the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in realms of glory will cost you something. It will cost you everything. You have to do what Matthew 16 says, lay down your life to gain it. <laughs> and it's worth it. It's worth it a million times over. Most every one of us, I'm sure, Lana, and you guys have gone through this same thing. We began to pursue the, the deep, really meaningful things of God. You, you, know, you began to separate yourself, not willingly, but just out of circumstance. Because not everyone wants to walk that road. Not everyone wants the narrow way. But it is what John said. It is the apocalypso. The unveiling, the disclosure, the manifestation, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what matters. <laughs> and his bride, his remnant company, the overcomers, those that are victorious, those that overcome Laodicean Christianity. It says in that age, will sit with him on his throne as he overcame to sit with his father. It says in the Ephesian church age, when you overcome, the spirit of the age, you'll eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. But it's going to cost you something. In fact, it says so right there in Revelation 3 to the Laodicean church. It says, I advise you. You know, it says that you think that you're rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. That's the deception. But Jesus said, you're rich and miserable, right? And that's talking about the corporate organized church of the 20th and 21st century. Let's just be honest about it. That's not meant for it. But he says, I got advice for you. I advise you to buy. That's the key word. I advise you to buy of me gold refined by fire and white garments to cover the shame of your nakedness. And I stab that you may have revelation. I, I stab that you may be a seer. Jesus gave advice. And I think we need to heed that advice. Because when we do, it'll cost you. You have to buy something. When I read that many years ago, Back in the 90s, I said, okay, Lord, what's my currency? And it took me a while, but I finally got the answer. My currency is my will. Not my will, but thine be done. That's losing your life. Again. So, amen. I just want to prophesy that and just, you know, maybe some of you guys might want to watch this message I did called Another Exodus. I believe that's where we are right now. A great awakening coming within the church, within the community of believers to lay aside the other gospel and embrace the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we'll let Amy pick it up from there. Well, that is so good. I've heard him preach that many times, and I love it every time. I'm still taking notes. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I've been uh, talking about for like the last year about these matchsticks that I had in an experience a few years back, and I was given two large matchsticks, and one matchstick burned up the old way, and the second matchstick lit the way to the one true revival. And over a course of time, I was just meditating and asking the Lord, what, um, what is that second matchstick? What is the second matchstick? And the second matchstick is submission. That is that submitting my will, yielding my will to the will of the Father. And this morning, as I was just... Uh, praying through all of this and going over just my thoughts for today. I wrote down a little journal entry based on a couple of things I had found in my notes, and I'm going to read it here to, to get started. Um, this is what I wrote. The torch, I heard this from the Lord, the torch you carry today carries a flame that initiates a full-blown fire of the Spirit. This fire lights the way to the one true revival, one true revival. The flame on the torch is submission. There is a freedom in this submission. For the blood of Jesus is the light of submission. This fire has forged and carries many colors. These are the colors of the heroes that have gone before us. Now the colors of this freedom will radiate in the remnant. She will be imbued with light. Oh, I love that. Those colors, the colors of freedom will radiate in the remnant, and she will be imbued with light. I was thankful to the Lord when I heard him say this, and I started to really just ask the Lord and process with the Lord. I've been doing so over the last year, but regarding this submission, 
What is submission? Well, I believe that the Lord has shown me a piece of what submission is. You know, we've looked at submission in such a fearful way before. Like, I'm going to have to really lose all these things that are precious to me when it's not that way at all. Submission is um, when we come into this place where we revere him fully, where we stand in awe of the most high God. If I can't talk about standing in awe of him without getting easy, because he's worthy of our reverence. He's worthy of our awe. We are all inspired sons of God. That's what we are. That's our destiny, to be awe-inspired sons of God. If we can grab a hold of that, then it makes the narrow way something we can do. This is part of the narrow way to stand and revere him in such a way. I love Malachi 2 where it says, My covenant with him is one of life and peace. I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and he stood in all of my name. True instruction is in his mouth and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and he turned many back from iniquity. I love that. So the object of reverence is submission. So it's our submission. I'm submitting my will to the will of the Father. We look at the heroes that have gone before us. I had a dream recently, and I was on this mountain of faith, and I was ascending this mountain of faith, and I, I looked up, and it was a struggle. You know, I was I was having to come to this place of constant submission, and I was getting wisdom and understanding so that I could ascend this mountain. And I was feeling weak, and I don't know if I can do it. Am I strong enough? Can I submit enough? Is all these things that go through our mind, can we do this? Can we even do this? Can we ascend the mountain? Who will ascend the mountain but the one with clean hands and a pure heart? I love that. Can we ascend the mountain? Can we submit in such a way? And I looked up and I saw there were colors painted on the hills. These beautiful colors and they were painted by the heroes of faith that had gone before us. Now that gave me sort of an encouragement, a boost to continue to ascend the mountain. There was a color there was a sound, there was a dance, there was, there's a walk that we have, and we leave our color on the hill. And that was such an important thing when I saw this, the Lord was showing it to me, and it became like a strength. It became a strength to be able to ascend this mountain, and we do this by submission. For quite some time, I've been praying and prophesying in different places. Um, I heard the Lord a time ago say that we're moving from intercession power the resurrection power. It's not the way it needs to be. We're moving into this place. Um, we're not doing things the way we need to. We're not in a place of just feeding and begging. We're standing on our feet now and we're moving and we're going to begin to move in resurrection power unlike anything we have done before. And I and I had this in my notes and I came across them this morning and I felt that it applied today. Submission is the gateway to resurrection power. Submission is the gateway to move in resurrection power in such a way. Can we submit our will to the will of the Father? I want to read something. I don't want to take too long, but I'm going to read something in just a minute. But I want to go over a couple of verses. Um, one thing that I remember um, about the series of dreams that I've had lately, the one where I was able to really uh, get me strengthened to go up that mountain, I realized that submission does come. You know, it allows us not only to ascend the mountain, to go to these places, to go to other realms, but this submission, um, it allows us to truly be known by God. When it talks about Moses in the scripture, it says that Moses was known by God face to face. God knew him. God knew Moses because Moses was submitted, open, laid bare, vulnerable before the Most High. How do we come to that place where we submit ourselves in such a way that we're known by God like a fire knows a land. We're known by him in such a way. Well, I believe that it has to do with this reverence and fear, reverence and a reverential fear and awe that we can revere him unlike we ever have before. When Paul Keith and I do meetings, whether online or in person, um, we pray before the meetings that the, that the the people that are hearing and learning, that we're learning from and that are learning from us, that they, that their reverence and awe would go to another level, that they'd never revere him less than they do right now. 
And I pray that for you that's watching now. I pray that for you that your reference will increase, that it will explode, that it will continue to grow exponentially as you stay in the presence of the Most High, as you submit your will to the Lord's perfect design, to his perfect design. We're not going to hold on to the old design, the old thing that we were walking in before, the old way, the old model. We're going to grab a hold of God's design. We're going to move forward in the Lord's design. Even right now, I encourage you with that. I encourage you that your awe, the awe and reverence you have for God is going to grow. And everything in your business, in your home, in your family, in your relationships, in church, and in everywhere, you're going to submit yourself in such a way that your reverence grows. So it's because of reverential fear that we get to move into more <laughs> reverential fear. That's how that works. We submit ourselves and we revere him. And what we get is more reverence and more submission. It's such a beautiful thing. It's how we will experience the glory, even as Moses did, even greater than Moses will be able to experience such glory. And that's such a beautiful thing. I have more, but we are getting here on the end of time. So I'm going to read one more little thing before I wrap this up. It has to do with awe and reverence. It has to do with who we are and what we do. And it's become a, a declaration for me. And let me just read it here. The fear of the Lord, a great privilege bestowed upon us. A revelation of reverence is available for his beloved. A revelation of reverence and submission is available for you. The revelation of that is available, and I prophesy that now you're going to get it. You're going to get a greater revelation of reverence. You're going to get it. You see, if we, I know that right now with all the things going on, the world is going to get darker, but we get to be light to shine in the darkness, like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. That's our great privilege. That's our opportunity. As those that submit our will, we will be lights that shine in the darkness. And in that place, our opinions and our wild and crazy emotions and all of those things aren't necessary. When we submit our will to the will of the Father, we're saying, my opinions, they're not valid. I want your opinion, God. You know, and I'll ask Paul Key sometimes, what's your opinion on this matter? And he'll say, well, my opinion doesn't matter. I need God's opinion. And we've been, we've been praying that. We've been asking for the Lord in different situations. Give us your opinion, Lord. Give us your design. We'll speak when you tell us your opinion. And I can hear the Lord just you know, come into this place where you fear me. That's the opinion of the Lord right now, that we would grow in reverence and fear of the Lord. Okay, let me finish this here. The revelation of reverence is available for his beloved. It's a gift. An object of affection from the Most High being presented to us of its portion are life and peace. That's that of Malachi 2. Its essence is all. So if we're struggling to grab a hold of life, if you feel like you're, you're just you're fading, your legs aren't strong, like I felt in my dream, your legs don't feel strong, step into this place. Ask the Lord for a revelation of greater awe than you've ever had before. And you're going to experience life like you've never experienced it before. That's a promise from the Lord. I prophesy that to you. This day, the affectionate ones, that's us, the ones that have great affection for the Most High, submitting, having submitted it all. Still, we long for perfect union. We position ourselves to finally abide. True fellowship will be recognized by His righteousness and by the reverence from our inner being. That's our destiny. Amen. Yeah, we'll just pray that. <clears throat> uh, Lord, I'm just thankful, God. I'm thankful that you choose us. I can feel that in my spirit that some of you watching going, but did he choose me? Did he choose me for this destiny? It's like a question in your head and you know it that you know that he's chosen you, but you can't, you're having a hard time grabbing a hold of it. Well, you're going to get the revelation now. As I'm prophesying and he's prophesying and we're praying, you're going to get the revelation. You're going to begin to see things like you haven't before. Because all of these things that we think we need to do, that we're trying to do all these little things, when all we have to do in this time is submit our will to his design. 
submit our will to his design. Come before him in such a way we've never come before him before and revere him more than ever. So I prophesy to you, you're going to get a revelation of that. Lord, I ask that you would bring each one a revelation of this. Awe and reverence, this is the message. This is going to lead us to a greater understanding of who you are. It's going to give us access to the seven spirits of God unlike ever before. We're going to have greater access now. This access was made, it's, it's for a certain people. It's for us. It's been stored up and we get to access it because of the reverential fear of the Lord. We're going to have a greater understanding of the spirit of knowledge so that we can know him and be known by him as even Moses was, known by him face to face. I pray, Lord, that by the spirit of understanding, you would bring understanding to the people, that we would know where to stand and where not to stand. In Jesus' name. I just feel some authority to play, pray one quick thing before we uh, end our session. I felt some authority as she was speaking to just ask the Lord to pour water, the spirit on the seed of God mm -hmm. inside of you. Everyone that's watching, I felt, I felt some real authority to speak that, that there would be an awakening, a full awakening of the seed of God in you, which is your seed of destiny, mm -hmm. and that it would cause you to lay aside every weight and encumbrance and obstacle that stands in the way of the high calling of God. We're not going to settle for a calling. We're going to go for the high calling. We're going to go for union with the Messiah. Yes. We're going to go for full submission yes. and yielding of our will to the will of the Father, yes. that we can be a pioneer in this day, a yes. forerunner of things to come, tasting the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Yes. Amen and amen. 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 There we go. I am unmuted. I'm learning. <laughs> oh, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much, guys. I just feel like I was sitting here and I felt like I was just under a waterfall. Just the weightiness of his presence was just so, so thick. Um, and so I want to thank you for what you've poured out. Guys, I know um, those of you watching, I know many of you are commenting going, oh, I can't hear properly. There's a bit of um, internet issues. If you put in your earbuds on the replay, um, you'll be able to hear a little bit better. Um, but I want to encourage everybody, please go back and re-watch this session and the sessions to come because I know even as I was listening to Paul, Keith and Amy, I was like, oh, Lord, I'm being so ministered to. I just want to go back and just really, engage with what they were sharing because it, it's the heart of God. I felt like it was such a word of invitation, but also alignment, you know, positioning us in this moment for what God is going to do. So thank you again, guys. I would just so love and appreciate you both right. so very much. Is um, Can you just let me know the, the website on the screen? That's all right. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that's right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, got Awesome. Yeah. I think there's a bit of a lag, so I'm sorry if I'm talking over the top of you. <laughs> oh, no. no, it's okay. It's good. We're, we're good. We're good. Okay. Awesome. Well, bless you guys. Thank you so much again for joining us. Everyone, I encourage you. I know many, 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 many of you already follow Paul, Keith and Amy, but if you don't, please jump on their website um, and YouTube. You will be so richly blessed as you've seen today. So bless you guys thank you so much love you too <laughs> see you later all righty everybody well now we have one of my dear friends matt beckenham let me get him up here or maybe kevin <gasps> look at that <laughs> hello matt good to see you hey lana it's awesome to see you as well Yay. It's so good. I'm just sitting here thinking, how am I going to get all this to work? And I've got Kev in the background over there and he's doing it all. So that's awesome. Um, well, it's so good to have you, Matt, as always. Um, you know, it's just such a joy. I know I say this every time that we do things like this together, but it's so the truth. Like I just, I so appreciate who you are and what you carry and, um, and your heart for the Lord and the purity um, that not only you carry, but the revelation that you release. And I know so many people, um, you know, have been so blessed by what you 
um, have been pouring out. So I'm excited about what you're going to share. Um, yeah. Am I cutting you off? Sorry, it's a bit yep. laggy on my end. <laughs> no, it's all good. I'm looking forward to sharing too, Lana, and just thank you for giving this giving this opportunity and trusting me. Oh, it's always a joy. And for those of you um, that don't know, Matt uh, lives in Sydney with his beautiful wife, Trish. Um, they do a lot of online stuff, uh, which I'll get Matt to just tell you a little bit about at the end that you can join in. But Matt is the uh, senior pastor of Haberfield Baptist Church. And Matt often says this, don't you, Matt, when you say the word Baptist, people... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you don't think Baptist, like, yeah, because I know some people contact afterwards and they go, wow, like, you know, especially <laughs> Americans, and they go, Matt doesn't fit the box of the American Baptist. I'm like, no. <laughs> yep. um, yeah, but guys, I'm going to stop talking because I could just sit here and just just keep talking with Matt for the next half an hour, but I'm not going to do that. So, um, Matt, thank you again for being part of this, and I'm really looking forward to what you're going to share. Oh, thanks, Lana. And thank you for everyone tuning in. This is just such a powerful uh, topic that Lana's uh, asked us to speak into, and to listen to every perspective is like looking at uh, a diamond in seven or eight different ways. And you're going to be hearing, I guess, the narrow path in those ways. So it was really cool listening to Paul Keith speak about the new exodus that's happening. It's really cool hearing Amy talk about the remnant and just the, the kaleidoscope of colour that the remnant carry. And uh, that that phrase really spoke into my spirit because that uh, the kaleidoscope, I don't know if you use kaleidoscope or something like that, but it was just that we all carry something unique. We all carry something so uh, so God and so beautiful and so powerful and uh, it's a season for that to be released it's a season for that for the world to see God in it and through us and and so when Paul Keith is talking about the new exodus uh, again as the children of Israel uh, left Egypt all those years ago uh, all of Egypt stood and watched and it was just an, a magnificent experience of seeing the father lead and uh, into the most extraordinary time of, of Israel's life. But so I just love picking up on what pe people are saying about this very topic. So for me, the narrow path and the wide path, and again, I know Lana picked up on the concept of me being Baptist, and I know that might be strange or odd for a couple of people, but uh, I just want to say to you, like, for the longest time, like I've been raised and grown in quite a conservative atmosphere, um, but in the last uh, 25, 30 years, the Father has really uh, spoken a new thing into that. And um, and the, the power of the Holy Spirit is something that is so, so valuable to me and so necessary and so essential. It's our design. I think a uh, Christian life lived without the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure you can put those two phrases together because uh, I know that the Spirit of God lives within me and that's something that I want to live from. But I know when I was younger, the concept of the narrow path and the wide path it was very much used very strongly in evangelistic talks. And so you'd be told that you don't want to go down that wide path because that wide path is actually leading you to hell. And, and let me just explain to you what hell looks like. And, and, and often our evangelism revolved around more what hell looked like than what heaven looked like. And I'm not denying that hell is there, but you find that if you scare people so much, that's only going to have so uh, have a lifespan of as long as the fear is around. Uh, but if you love people, if you draw people into the kingdom of God through love, love is an eternal quality. So if any relationship you have, if you scare people or you control people by fear, that relationship will only last as long as the fear that you can use or control. But if you love people, that relationship all of a sudden immediately becomes eternal. Just think about that for a moment. Every relationship in your life that you love, everything that you love, there's an eternity statement over that. Why? Because God is love and as you love, God flows from you and your relationships become eternal. And so when uh, the concept for me of the Holy Spirit came and I started looking at some of these scriptures from the paradigms that we used to be taught, and I quickly saw that often our language, our dialogue, our narrative, uh, can very much be fear-based as Christians rather than faith-based, rather than love-based or grace-based 
if I can use that to, to rhyme a little bit. But the concept inside of that is, is that I believe God is love. And so if we're going to understand God, we've got to come from a place of his character. And if you know, Jesus is the, is the image of the Father, as, as the Bible says, then we've got to understand that Christ flows in the power of love. And so when he's sharing, where he, when he's speaking, when he's teaching, uh, we've got to learn to listen through the lens of love. And so I sat in this place of the, the narrow gate. And now uh, most of us, whenever Jesus uses a metaphor or a parable, uh, our imaginations are kicked into gear. So if anyone ever asks you, where does Jesus talk about um, using your imagination or where does he teach about using your imagination? Well, you can actually reply with often and, uh, and throughout the Gospels. Why? Because every time he invites us into a metaphor, he is inviting us to use our imagination and to use our imagination to see something that's actually physical. And so when Jesus says there's two gates here, there's a, there's a wide one and there's a narrow one, uh, he's inviting us into a place of using our imagination. Now, I wonder whether even today as we're doing this, whether we could actually use our imagination to think about what does that gate actually look like? If we could stop just for a moment and just go, Let's just put aside the, the images or the pictures from the past or even the generational teaching of what that narrow gate looks like. Let's just stop for a moment and imagine the narrow gate. As I was preparing for this this morning, I was just sitting with Jesus and asking for that, that picture of the narrow gate. And all of a sudden I realised the gate that I'm looking at in my imagination is wide open. But every time I've seen this in, in picture or art form, have we got any... Uh, any artists listening to this, I'd love to see a picture of the narrow gate, but the gate open. In Revelation, Jesus talks about the door that is now open that nobody can close. And as I had this picture of an open gate, and the, it felt like in my imagination it started to build a conversation around what that looks like. For so long, we've just think that that's closed and we've got to come to it and wait for someone to open it. But there's Jesus. And in John 10, he says, I actually am the gate. I am that very gate. And all who come in and through me will find green pastures. I love that concept of Jesus being that gate. I love the concept of Jesus being open. I love the concept of Jesus being so much in love with us that the invitation is so rich for us that he invites us into that place of the green pastures. Now, the Bible in, in, in Matthew 7 says that the path that leads from that is difficult and is challenging. And I think anyone who's been a Christian for any length of time would get that and know that and understand that. There are some times when we deal with disappointments in our lives and we are crying out to God and saying, why, God, why, why is that happening? And the road is difficult. And the road is challenging. But what I found also with John 10, Jesus says, I am the gate, but he also says, I am the shepherd and I lead my sheep. And the whole concept of leading my sheep is not that he leads just one of us. He leads all of us. He walks with all of us. And so much of my Christian life at times, I've, I've just pared down to the one and I've got to try and work this stuff out myself. And, and the father's like, no, I'm actually doing this with you. I'm raising up other people with you. To walk this this path and that yeah it's difficult it's challenging the apostle paul and thessalonians would actually say hey there's you're going to be persecuted you're going to be thrown into jail and, and some of you are even going to die for your faith and so again the concept that's the things that happen inside of this life of ours that are difficult and challenging we don't understand and so we get it when jesus says that there is a challenge that's on us to walk this path but the gate is there the path is there christ is on the path he's willing to walk that path with us and so he can be a gate he can be a shepherd he can be all of those things and he's inviting us into that place the broad gate or the wide gate and the broad road uh, inside of that uh, the concept that it says many are walking that path and I started thinking about that and I went all the way back to the Old Testament and talked about when people would just they did what they felt was right at the time. They did what they felt was right in their own eyes. And how much is that the generation that we're actually living in now? And how much of that does that does this generation need an expression of the love of God that surpasses 
all kinds of aspects that we're seeing in our side, the society right now, whether it be a pandemic and fear, whether it be racism, whatever it is, how much does our society need a full expression and a full encounter of his love? And, and, and guess what? He's given that to us to do. He's given that to us to do. He says, I abide in you. The fullness of Christ lives in you. The fullness of Christ flows from you. He is the light of the world and he is within you. And so when we talk about the remnant having all kinds of colours under the sun, as we shine, as we release what the Father has placed upon us, then we release something of the kingdom of God to the world that we live in. And I love how Amy spoke about the different colours. And if you think about that, what is your favourite colour? What is your favourite colour? Now, if you go to dream interpretation or vision interpretation, you can see what that colour actually means. You can see see what it means. Some of you have got a few different colours. Some of you have got all the colours of the rainbow. You are the ones who carry life. For me, the concept of red or green is so strong inside of my spirit and red represents love. Green, I think, often represents freedom and I want to use the love that God has given to me to lead people into the place of freedom that I have discovered as I've come to that narrow gate and come through with Christ and knowing that as I've come through, he is leading forward. It is so powerful and our world needs a full encounter an expression of his love. They need to see what it is to walk through the narrow gate. They need to know it more than a metaphor. They need to know it for the reality that it is, for the encounter that it is, for the power that it is, for the freedom that it is, for the friendship that it is. Christ desires to walk with and to walk in. This is our kind of life. That's what, that's what he does. When you go to the other scripture that Lana is pointing to in this, this, uh, this teaching in, in Matthew 16, we come to this. It's nearly like a, a riddle that Jesus uses. And he says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Uh, you, you will save it. Uh, and so in the Greek there, it talks about if you resolve that your design is that you're going to try and save yourself, you can't. You can't. But, but if you seek to live for him, you'll find life and you'll find salvation. The word find there is the same one uh, of in, in Matthew 7 where, where Jesus says, if you find the narrow path, it's the same word. And that word find means to discover. And I love the, the impact of that word, of the word discover. I actually prefer the word discover than the word find because for me a discovery is something of value, something of richness, something of God's glory. And, and if, I, if I live for him, if I live with him, if I live in him, if I let the love of Christ flow from me, the discoveries just keep coming. They just keep coming. And as those discoveries keep coming, I find him. I find him and the Bible says I'll be saved. And the word saved in the Greek means to be delivered or to be set free. And as I discover him, I find that I am set free to live with him from the fullness that he has placed within me. And from that fullness, the overflow of the spirit of God will come into the world that, that we see around us. It is so profound. It is so powerful. This narrow gate that few find Sometimes I find that kind of a riddle as well, as if, oh, well, maybe I'll just stumble on that gate at some point. But you know what? For those of us who have gone through that gate, that metaphoric gate, for those of us who have found Christ in this way, for those of us who have come to that, that revelation of how much he loves and how much he sets us free, how much he has forgiven, how much he has released us into this place of transformation, uh, my greatest desire in my life is to lead people in and through that gate to encounter him, to discover him, and to know that, that gate is wide open. That gate is to be found. That gate, it, it, once it's found, it's, it's like the call of my heart. I just want people to come to that full knowledge or that full experience of what that love looks like. Like who here does not love being loved? And Jesus like, yeah, I, I loved you first. That's what I did. I actually loved you first. I came to you first. I invested in you first. I, I 
I got rid of all that stuff that we call sin and I made you clean. And, and then he spoke of the apostle Peter, what I declare clean, let no one declare unclean. And so here's Jesus with this great gift that he's given to us of releasing us from sin and shame to live in, in the wholeness and in the place of cleanliness, if that's the right word, in the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's got to be tangible. It's, it's got to be real. Last year, I, I went to uh, Lebanon on, on a mission. And I was invited to go with, uh, the, with uh, Baptist World Aid to look at the work that uh, local churches are doing on the ground in Lebanon dealing with the Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, and when we went, we were told this is the, the second biggest humanitarian crisis in the world at the moment. And, um, and I was asked to go, I was invited to go just to, to let's see what God's doing there, Matt. Can you give us some understanding inside of what God's doing there? Well, I want to say when I got there, I had, I'm not sure I've ever had a, a more life-transforming moment when I got to see the narrow gate time and time and time again. Like I could spend hours talking about this, but let me just give you one story of the narrow gate that I sat and I was absolutely schooled in the love of God. And when you get schooled in the love of God, it's not a lesson that it's just theory. It's an invitation into engaging with the fullness of his love. So it's not like you've just gone, okay, that's a cool lesson. I need to learn that. So let's just go go find that and we'll, we'll apply that. It, when the Father leads you into a... Uh, a time of revelation. He's leading you like deeper into the river of life. He, he's leading you into the fullness of, of what that love actually feels like and, and how, how you engage with that. And so when I got there, uh, I was listening to so many stories that just broke your heart, broke my heart. So many stories of what humanity does to each other. Stories that you couldn't even exaggerate. That was so bad. And I was watching uh, these Syrian churches uh, minister to, to people, the Syrian refugees. Now, if you know anything about the crisis there, you'll know that it wasn't that long ago that the Syrians were actually invading and hurting Lebanon. And I was, I was sitting in a church uh, that was within sight of the Syrian border that was ministering to Syrian refugees and it was copying flack from a bunch of Christians because they were helping Muslims. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, when are we going to get it that the Father loves everyone? But I saw it. I witnessed it and watched it. And we went out into a, like a, a refugee city, and it's like a tent city, and, and um, this particular church is building a school, a, a medical centre, um, a, a community area, like an op shop, um, all kinds of different facilities. And I got chatting to one of the builders there and I just asked him, why are you doing this? When, when so much pain has been brought on your country by these people, why are you doing this? And he looked at me and said, I don't understand the question. It could be he spoke in Arabic and I spoke in English. So I was working through a translator. And so I took my time just to say, can you explain to me why? Like, what's the motivation here? And he looked at me and he said, because we love. Straight away, I'm looking at the narrow gate. Straight away, I'm seeing the narrow gate. For this guy, it wasn't even a question whether he loved or not. That was his design. That's what he did. He just, he just loved. And I'm looking at that narrow gate through the lens of this guy. So I'm, the metaphor, I'm looking at this narrow gate through the lens of this guy. And it's like the Spirit of God is saying to me, can you understand the power of forgiveness now? And it's like your mind blows in that moment. Can I understand the power of forgiveness? And it's like God's saying, forgiveness is like a superpower. It restores and redeems and heals and sets people free. It, it removes obstacles on the road so that we can actually do relationship. And I'm standing there with this builder guy who's been building his whole life, and he's just like, I don't understand your question. I don't understand. I'm looking at the narrow gate. I'm seeing the narrow gate. I'm seeing this guy just give up time, life, resources to do whatever he needed to do to make sure those people there were honoured, those people were loved, those people, even though they're identified as Muslim, they were being loved on by the full expression of the kingdom of God right there through a builder who goes, I don't even understand your question. 
we went back to the, to the church that that uh, is doing this work. And like I said, they're copying criticism from other churches for reaching out into the Muslim world. Um, but this church runs a service for Syrian refugees. And uh, and so as they're ministering and loving these people just so richly and so powerfully, uh, and if you ever want to see the love of God drive away fear, uh, come with me to Lebanon at some point and, and just you'll see it. You cannot help but see it but and feel it and encounter it and just let it change your life. But but the concept inside of it, I sat and I listened to, to one of the experiences they had in one of these Syrian um, church services. At one point they had a, a young man who'd come to Jesus and uh, in that place, uh, his family ostracized him. His family ridiculed, persecuted him and kicked him out. And sometime later, his mum actually called him up and said, listen, we want to reconcile. And, and the son's just like, fantastic. Maybe this is what Jesus is doing or, or maybe this is about it. And so he goes to the place to be, to be reconciled with his mum. I need to be found with men there who beat him within an inch of his life, broke his jaw, broke bones in his body. And it just, just... His own family, and so he comes to church uh, either the next week or soon after that, and he's and he's obviously uh, damaged. And he's standing in the service, and he says to Jesus, "You need to tell me if you're real today, because if you are not, I'm not doing this." Once again, I want you to see the narrow gate here. I want you to see how Christ works. So the service starts, and as the service starts, uh, they start. Um, uh, they, they do a thing at the start of their services. They, they don't start by, hey, welcome, it's great to have you in church. They say, who's had a prayer answered today? And so people are starting to answer prayer. And this guy's like, Jesus, you've got to show up. You've got to show up. They start singing. And inside the singing, all of a sudden, this young man just goes absolutely nuts. He's out of control. He's yelling and he's screaming and the people around don't know what to do. With. Like traditionally in, in Lebanon, many Christians are very conservative. And so they're seeing this happen going, what is going on? Is this of God? What is of this? And so eventually they could not calm this guy down. So the pastor himself took him from the service and put him in a car to take him home. And somewhere between the church and home, he calmed down. And the pastor said, what just happened? This man. He says, I was, he said, this is what I said to Jesus at the start of this service. And, uh, and as we started seeing, I saw Jesus on that cross at the front of that, that room. And Jesus came off the cross and walked to me and said to me, I am here, I am for you, and I love you. And this guy just loses it, absolutely loses it. He's had his narrow gate experience. He's had his encounter. He's had this moment. And so here am I sitting in, in the in, in right in this little church that's in, inside of the Syrian border, and I see a man who's been led to Jesus. He's come to the narrow gate, and the gate's been opened. But in that place, he's had an encounter with Jesus that has absolutely blown his mind. And through that encounter, he now has a church that testifies of that very encounter. He has a church who has been transformed by the encounter of Christ that's happening. So what are we seeing? More people coming to the open gate. We see the love of God meeting them at the open gate and welcoming them into that place where the love is not even a question. It's just the reality of what they do. And through that, they are finding, they are discovering life. They are discovering freedom. You know, put it in context. These people have nothing. The Syrian refugees have nothing. But when you meet a person who carries the love of God, you see the widow with two coins that Jesus points out at the temple. You see a woman who comes in and just cries over Jesus' feet and breaks open a very expensive a jar of perfume. You see lepers that come to Jesus with nothing but other than the faith and the hope in their life that the love of God might reach out and touch them. What is happening? The narrow gate. Time and time again, they are being led through to be with, and then they are partnered with people who will testify with them and empower them and encourage them. Is that not the kingdom of God? Is that not the kingdom of God? Let me just finish by just landing it with, with this. When I come to the gate, I come to the one. Why is it narrow? Because you can only come through Christ. You've got to come through him. You've got to come through the one. You've got to meet him. You've got to encounter him. 
Sometimes in churches, we get them to encounter a message, but I want to go past the message and encounter Christ. I value the message. It's the very message that set me free. But the encounter of Christ is the one who has delivered me into a greater sense of understanding of transformation, restoration. And through that encounter, the Father is drawing others that partner with me. It's something Patricia and I, as we do our life and do our ministry and do our family, we desire to see people walking in the fullness of coming through the one. We are no longer just doing what we think is right and walking whichever way we want. We now come to the one who has made us right and we are now following the one who has designed us and the one who has created us to live in the fullness of his son and being transformed more and more into the image of his son. This is the narrow gate. And for me, it is the only gate that I have seen and found and desire now to lead other people through. So that's my concept on the narrow gate. I'm trusting that everyone's still with me, um, but I just say, want to say thank you for that. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. You never fail to amaze with just the depth of heart and revelation that you carry. Um, and we're, we're blessed to be part of that. Thank you for inviting us into that today. Um, you, you just, you've walked just an amazing journey and your testimony is always incredible. Thank you. Um, hey, Matt, um, we've got, uh, I've got a banner going down this bottom of the screen here with some contact details. Um, this is, this is all right. So just have a feel Baptist and Matt Beckenham on Facebook. Yep, that's who I am. Uh, that's what I do. I, I do a thing called prophetic mentoring, which I just help people listen for the voice of God. If that interests you, just contact our website and you can find details on that. Um, and I'm more than happy to help people uh, encounter um, and be empowered by God's voice and just live out of a place of relationship with him. But, yeah. Amen. That's fun me. And, and we're contacted by a lot of people who've met you through, you know, the work that we've done. And, you know, they're, they're always very blessed um, by your you know, your prophetic encountering, your um, your mentoring, um, your, you know, just, just how you bring people up to the, you know, up to the confidence of hearing God's voice and, you know, being just able to speak with authority in their own lives. So thank you for, thank you on behalf of them for what you've done. And I, I hardly enjoy um I hardly recommend anyone to come and partner with uh, Matt and what he does. Um, he's he really does bless so many people through his work. Um, his websites uh, there or contact him through Facebook. Yeah. Um, thanks, bro. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity no. just to pour out my heart to you guys and just want to say how much I love you too. I just love the integrity. I love the purity that you guys walk in, and it's just so powerful. I just just mm -hmm. love hanging out with you guys. Thank you. Well, we we love hanging out with you too, mate. And uh, you're the most uh, the, the, you're the most genuine of genuine. Um, <laughs> and and that's that's often a hard thing to find these days. Um, thank you, and thank you for your kind words too. We love you, mate. I'm going to uh, transition now to.